in various capacities but uh, later uh, uh, when inspired by dr mr rajagopal who is our founder chairman um, she got joined with palim india in 2016 and uh, presently she is uh, leading the facilitation team uh, which facilitates the formation of palliative care centers uh, across india so uh, they have a team of coordinators in different parts of india um, through which uh, uh, through them uh, shalini works uh, with uh, various um, uh, palliative care institutions as well as with uh, state uh, state governments Uh, union territories mm. and uh, she is also involved in um, making the opioids available uh, to the institution because uh, some of you may be facing some issues uh, in procuring uh, and uh, dispensing opioids so chalni would be uh, uh, the person who will help you uh, uh, how to do that and things like that uh, so uh, chalni uh, welcome you and uh, uh, we will uh, wait uh, for the doubts from the uh, participants so thank you dr sunil uh, good evening to everyone uh, very happy to be here and uh, very happy to uh, answer any doubts that you have uh, dr sunil i'm connecting with this group in this forum for the first time so do we uh, straight away go ahead with the questions uh, because I, i think they already have the presentations and the audio clips that they have gone through mm uh, i think uh, we can wait for their uh, okay. queries and then uh, if you want to get introduced then we can do that sure so i see there are a lot of doctors around uh if uh, as a quick one i think there are one two three, 12 people around uh if you can quickly sh- give me an introduction about which location you are located uh you know where are you working then probably we can discuss more on those and then you can ask your questions can we start with the prarthna Hi, ah, yes, ma'am. I'm working in Kanyakumari district. Okay, great. Thank you, Uncle. Thank you, Pratha. Hello. Okay. Ah, uh, Doctor Jayanandan. Uh, Palka district uh, for an um, elderly care project under government of Kerala. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have Dr. Manglik Das. Hello, madam. I'm from Kolkata ESI Institute of Pain Management. Oh, great! It's uh, ESI Institute. Yes, Dr. ESI Institute uh, of. Okay, Dr. Shubhrata Goswami's uh, center. Dr. Gaurav yes, Jain. yes. He is my mentor. Okay. Uh, he passed away uh, two months ago. Yeah, we are very sorry to hear that, but uh, yes. We're glad to have you here. Uh, you. Antra, uh, it says Antra Rahman. Hello, ma'am. It's Antra Rahman. I'm working in uh, Saudi uh, Saudi Arabia as an emergency medicine specialist. Okay. Thank you. We have uh, Chandrika Booth. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Good evening. Sure. And and what role are you in? Ma'am, I am uh, senior. Uh, there is an echo is from Shalini side. Shalini side. Come. Ah. Ah. Shalini. Shalini. I don't. Pin from my laptop. From Can you speak again? 
Uh, I think uh, it was Dr. Chandrika's. Uh, yeah. Chandrika, ma'am. Uh, now it is. Now it is good. Yes. Now yes, it is okay. Okay, ma'am. Chandrika, ma'am, please continue speaking. Hi, yeah, ma'am. Good evening, ma'am. Myself, Dr. Chandrika Boos. I am practicing as an anesthesiologist in Government Medical College, Bhavnagar. That's Gujarat. Yes, ma'am. Gujarat. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ma uh, Anju Anna. Uh, I'm a medical oncologist. I'm working in Patanandita, Kerala only. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Asha. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm a dentist. I'm not practicing as a dentist, but interested in palliative care because my mom is... Uh, totally involved in palliative care and I'm in Muscat, Oman. Okay. Thank you for joining, Asha, from Muscat. Thank you. Uh, we have Nilakshi Khataniyar. Hi, good evening, ma'am. Uh, I work in Yashoda Hospitals, Hyderabad. Uh, it's a corporate setup. And uh, I'm a practicing radiation oncologist, but I have a very keen interest in pain and palliative care. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Okay. We have Isha next. Madam, I am from Kandu. Great, great. Thank you. Uh, we go to Dr. Meera Jairaj. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm working in, uh, currently I'm not working. I'm in Abu Dhabi. I'm a gynecologist. Uh, planning to come back to India and uh, get involved in palliative care. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Dr. Pankaj Kangal. Good evening, ma'am. I'm working as an ICU consultant done by post-graduation anesthesia at Nasik, Maharashtra. Nasik, Maharashtra. Thank you for joining. Uh, we have Dr. John C. James. Good evening, ma'am. I am uh, Dr. John C. James uh, from Kollam. I am working as a psychiatrist in uh, Lecture Deal. Oh, great. Are you working with Dr. Ali by any chance? Ali, yes, sir, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, ma'am. Yeah, we are working together here. Oh, great, great. Uh, thanks for joining. Thank and then we have Dr. Ajmal Salim. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Uh, I am from Trivandrum and I am working at Trivandrum Institute of Palliative Sciences as a junior palliative. Okay, okay. So that's our own Dr. Ajmal. <laughs> Thank you for joining, Dr. Ajmal. Uh, yeah. Great. Lovely to see this wide uh, presence of, you know, doctors from everywhere, international, national uh, level. So uh, we do have a couple of presentations on opioid availability and uh, as well as organizing palliative care. But what I understand is that you have already gone through those presentations and today you would have doubts to uh, ask. So uh, I'll just give you a little background of the work that I do with my team. And then probably you can come up with your uh, questions. So there is a, in comparison to Kerala, which is actually a leader in palliative care with respect to India, uh, in rest of the India, palliative care services are not so much available. It is only either available in silos or some doctors are doing in their own front in some uh, clinic or in, in their institutes. So our team particularly connects with all the doctors, all the institutes and anybody who's interested to create a palliative care service across India in different places and try to help them with opening up a palliative care center. Now that palliative care center can be anywhere. They can have an individual clinic. They might want to open up a palliative care department within their hospital. It can be a government hospital, a private hospital, or it can be a hospice unit that they want to build, um, probably you know for the terminally ill, or uh, if they, they just want to expand their work uh, otherwise. As a, as a hobby also. And of course, there are uh, options where, uh, you know, palliative care is also delivered through retirement living and old age homes these days. 
so we will we can take up each uh, center separately if you want to discuss and if you can want to share what are your plans then accordingly we can pick up uh, how we can help you so there are around five people of pallium india working all around india uh, trying to help the people there to open up palliative care centers so one is there in uh, dehradun uh, another person sits out of guwahati another person is in pune and one is in uh, chennai and uh, one is in delhi so all these people uh, can reach out to you if you face any issue with opening up your palliative care department or a center or a hospice anyone that you uh, you can reach out to us so before we actually show you a presentation again that will be a repetition any questions that you have from your learning so far Sorry to interrupt. Uh, I just uh, wanted to ask, uh, how many of you have opioids, or how many of you don't have opioids, or how many of you have already started working in palliative care? So many of you have expressed to that you would like to uh, start palliative care. So maybe something to break the silence. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Sridevi. Yeah. One of the things that the very first thing that you would need for a palliative care center is opioids uh wherever you are working do you have opioids at your center uh, at esi pain management we prescribe opioid uh, since 2020 okay. uh, so we have uh, morphine uh, immediate release and sustained release along with uh, buprenorphine patches Lovely. And how how were you able to procure these medicines, Dr. Das? Actually, we have a pharmacist team. So uh, actually we have the excess excise. We have the uh, government excess excise. So from there, we got the narcotic uh, license. And because of the narcotic license, we can uh, procure our uh, morphine and buprenorphine patch. Although uh before having morphine we 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 were using fentanyl in ot services so we uh, ha we had the excise uh, narcotic license so after that we have applied we applied for the morphine and then we got the morphine and buprenorphine patches okay, thank you. thank you dr das i think this is a very good uh trigger to discuss opioids and their availability right now. Uh, so just, I think we'll have to put up the presentation uh, on opioid availability. Uh, not this one, the other one, opioid availability presentation. So what happens is there is, uh, opioids is one of the medicines uh, the kind of medicines they are, they are under a lot of regulations by the government. In 1984, there was a regulation that came up which really limited their availability. Because of that, a lot of medical institutes and doctors did not have opioids. Then with the help of a lot of uh, people working in palliative care, Dr. Raj Kopal and many of his colleagues worked to change that law. That law was ultimately changed in 2014. And that law told uh, that there is only going to be one rule that will be there for all states. That is that they need to have a recognized medical institution certificate. So we'll I think we'll quickly go through that uh, presentation. You might have already gone through it. Just to bring the thoughts in sync, we'll go through that. Now, why there was this law where restriction of opioids were there? Why there is, uh, like Dr. Sridevi asked just now, some of you might not have opioids. So any of you who can raise hands who, say, who do not have opioids in your center? Any of you from this group? Okay, Isha says they don't have opioids. Anyone else? Okay, so it seems like uh, most of you have opioids. So 
if you have opioids, how are you procuring? Are you procuring the same way that Dr. Das uh, mentioned, that you have a license uh, through excise and uh, the new license and all? Okay, Riddhi says uh, they don't have. Okay, so we have two people who do not have. So Pratna says it's the same way that they have that license, okay? Anyone else? Okay, okay. That's one thing. Uh, so Dr. Priya is saying, I'm not sure I'll inquire with pharmacy department. That's that's the very first step, doctors, that you will have to understand. If you want to practice palliative care, one of the medicines that you need to have is opioids, which is primarily three medicines in India, which comes under this law, which is methadone, morphine, and fentanyl. For these three medicines, you will have to have a recognized medical institute certificate. I think let's go through the presentation and we'll take, take you through how you can procure it and then how what would be the right way to go about it with your pharmacist if you go there to discuss with him. So just, just your knowledge, I'm kind of giving you a, a, you know, a caution that this is little law that we'll be sharing, but I think this is going to help you. It's a very simple thing, but this will help you to understand how you can procure medicines opioids particularly for your centers. So Chandrika is saying we have license, but not easily available in our hospital. So yeah, first of all, let's understand why opioids are not easily available. Uh, as I mentioned in 1985, that rule had come where it said that no, because of misuse and because of pilferage, opioids is actually uh, addiction uh, causing medicine also so people who do not need it but they can still have it to get that high so opioids are is made of opium or poppy seeds which is also available as drugs for giving that high so that's the reason why such strong rule had come up now what we need to see is that we create a principle of balance whichever institute procures it has to have two responsibilities one is to prevent inappropriate and non-medical use of opioids, like prevent pilferage and misuse, but at the same time to ensure access to opioids for their patients, patients who are in pain. So I think I'll quickly skip this. It's just the use of opioids. It is, it is showing you that this patient who was for six weeks in, in this position, just by a tablet of morphine, you know, could sit upright and have a cup of tea. I think you all know you have gone through a lot of other sessions that how much opioids can help people in pain. So this is an example telling you that. Uh, and of course, there are 7 million Indians who are in serious health-related suffering, but only 4% of the needy are, going, are having pain relief. That is a study shown uh, which has shown this. So it's an evidence-based proof that opioids are not so much available in uh, in India and abroad also. Uh, the medical use of narcotic drugs continues to be indispensable for the relief of pain and suffering. Educate provision must be made to ensure the availability of narcotic drugs for such purpose. So this was the main agenda when Dr. Raj Kupal and a lot of his colleagues decided that we need to work to ensure that these opioids are available. He conducted a lot of opioid availability workshop, which we continue to do it today also. The facilitation team goes and work with drug controllers of the states, get them on into a session to actually talk to different medical institutes and tell them how they can procure the certificate and then how they can procure these medicines for their patients. And as it says, public health can only be achieved if we have a balance of both. Uh, it's a quick look at, uh, at a slide where it says how badly uh, you know, we need this medicine. So if you see only 4% in India have pain relief medicines. The usage of morph morphine is or the opioids is just 43 mg. So again, showing you the need of opioids, the availability of opioids, which has to be stronger. 
Now, this was the rule that I was telling you about in 2014. Uh, this act got amended after 19 years of efforts. So this act, when it got amended, it said that these three medicines, uh, fentanyl, methadone, and uh, morphine, all three of them have to be available. And for that, they changed the rule. The old rule said that you have to have a possession of a license. Some of you just mentioned that you have you have a license, which are the license numbers are NDPS2 or NDPS7. If you get into it, you speak to your pharmacist, you'll get to know that. You will have to have a license. You'll have to have an import permit, an export permit, transport permit. And there are multiple agencies were involved in issuing that certificate. Now, that old rule has been amended to a new one, which is a much, much simpler one. All states have the same rule for procuring these opioids. There is only one person who can give you that certificate, and that is the state drug controller. You do not have to go to excise. You do not have to go to transport or department or anywhere else. You just have to apply, give one application to the state drug controller on behalf of your institute, and you can get that certificate of recognized medical institute. But there are certain criteria that you have to fill. There are certain uh, basic eligibility uh, prerequisite conditions that you have to fill when you have to, uh, when you're applying for it. So in 2014, when this act got amended, uh, you know how difficult it is those, those act uh, which are created that has to be translated into rules. Rules so that people can make actions. So rules are basically actions. So in under those actions, which were published in 2015, there were these three medicines announced as essential narcotic drugs. And the institute was called Recognized Medical Institute, which are able to stock and dispense them. A lot of you might be able to procure these medicines still, but you might be going by the old rule. If you'll go and check with your pharmacist, if you'll go and check with the administration of your hospital or clinic, they must be procuring it under the uh, NDPS2 or NDPS7 license, which is not correct. As per the law, the, the new license that has to be there is RMI 3G certificate. We'll show you here. Now, what are the eligibilities of getting this certificate? One is... Uh, yeah, one is that the doctor has to be an MBBS or a BDS doctor who has been trained in pain management. Now, this training in pain management or palliative care, it can be an online training also. Like in Kerala, uh, our drug controller has approved online training as well. You apply to the drug controller of the state with the relevant form. We'll just show you the form with the name of the doctor who's going to take the accountability with all the certificates and a, uh, a documented annual estimate. We go to the next slide. Yeah, these are the important things that you have to submit. You can have a covering letter stating why do you need these opioids. You There is a filled application form 3F. Uh, we can show you further on to that. Uh, this is the uh 3f application form so if you just go through it it'll ask you for a complete name and postal address of your institute name of the head of the institute number of persons employed like who will be using particularly those opioids name of the number of the patients that you are treating category of rmi like is it palliative care unit or is it a, a for opioid substitution therapy or a direct administration probably is just a, a, a full hospital that you're asking for. Then the fifth one is where your name will come. Name of the qualified medical practitioner who would be in charge of the essential narcotic drugs. Here is your name the, for the, of, of the doctor who has got training in pain management or palliative care. That is where your you will be held responsible and the RMI will be in your name for your institute. If there is more than one qualified medical practitioner, then you can mention more names in sixth uh, row. 
and then number and date of the certificate when earlier if by chance this is a renewal request earlier it is and whether the requisite recognition of the institute was withdrawn or it is still there so this is the 3f form we'll go at the uh, the previous slide so that was that form 3f the next form that you have to fill is form 3j which estimated annual requirement of essential narcotic drugs like you you just give an estimate of how much your clinic or your hospital or your department needs for the next one year uh, for the first time people who are procuring it for the first time generally half a kg is what's uh, suggested to begin with for the whole year but you, if by chance you consume it already like through the half half year itself if you finish off all the opioids then you can apply just send a uh, annual estimate form again to update the drug controller that you are applying for more uh, additional amount of uh, opioids then of course the name of the doctor in charge medical graduation certificate your certificate of recognition your certificate of training and if you are sending it by post it's always uh, suggested that you send it by registered post so that you have a proof that you have sent your application and they also have a timeline of 60 days to respond to you within 60 days they have to respond to you whether your application has been accepted or it has been rejected or if there is something else that is needed we'll go to the next slide this is the 3j form that uh, estimate of annual requirement of essential narcotic drugs uh estimate for the year date of submitting estimate these are very simple self explanatory i'll just uh, you know give few minutes a uh, few seconds for you to just go through it the details of estimated annual requirement you can specify fentanyl and different formulation whatever uh, formulation that you require methadone syrup is available these days and fentanyl injection or patches or morphine tablets how many grams of morphine tablets all that comes in there and it gives you it it will ask you for the details what you have done in the last year but if you have not done in the last year you can leave that you can just say first time uh, applying and or if if you are uh, you have an estimate in your mind you can just give an estimate there go to the next this is how the records have to be maintained so one of the major things why a lot of institutes in spite of knowing this law in spite of knowing that there is an rmi certificate needed they are not going for it so why they are not go going for it because they have to maintain documentation again this is very important for uh, avoiding the misuse of or the pilferage of these opioids and that's why this thorough documentation is maintained where each patients the detail of each patients how much they have been given uh, these opioids and a signature from them and then the overall in charge signs the uh, the record so here you see dr rajkopal has signed for palium india this is the register of palium india where our morphine tablets and opioids are uh, you know the whole register is maintained so in the corner you see it has been signed by dr rajkopal of course all other doctors are also using their names are also there in the uh, certificate go to the next slide another aspect i think dr das mentioned that uh, you're from esi dr das government institutes any government hospital is a deemed rmi deemed rmi basically means you are exempted to apply for this 3g certificate you do not have to apply however you have to submit your annual estimate you will have to submit your annual estimate you will have to maintain all the documents all the uh, required documents in the form that is Uh, given by the rule so uh, again coming back to you dr das if you check with your pharmacist you 
uh, need not have an excise certificate or any other certificate. R even for RMI, 3G certificate also is not required. You are deemed RMIs, so they can simply place the order with the vendor and the vendor can supply. However, if you have a centralized uh, supply, then you can directly indent that uh, those medicines to them and they uh, those medicine can be supplied. You do not have to apply for the certificate. I think there is somebody from another medical college also here, somebody mentioned. So uh, you do not have to apply for the certificate. In Kerala particularly, we have 600 RMIs. Uh, which are stocking and dispensing. So that's a huge, huge number. Uh, and because Kerala has been so uh, advanced in knowing about palliative care, in uh, having so many palliative care centers across and out here because of the healthcare awareness, people are more aware about the rule as well as stocking it. But uh, yes, for the rest of India, it is it is very much uh, needed in every center, in every state. And that's what our team is working towards. Uh, morphine is supposed to be the low cost. Uh, the, uh, I think methadone is uh, coming very close to it now. Fentanyl are generally expensive. So people, because of that also, a lot of private institutes do not want to go for morphine. They go for fentanyl more. Uh, met as methadone is also inexpensive, but you need learning and guidance. And that's what Dr. Sunil and Dr. Sri Devi uh, run these training programs to tell you how you can use methadone also as a uh, substitute for certain pains, a uh, substitute of morphine for certain pains. So this is one of our attempts to educate all the uh, medical fraternity to create public awareness that pain relief is available. They don't have to just bear the pain, but also ask for it that they would want pain relief. And implementation of rules is some rules that have been created in 2015 is still not implemented in the states. We are still struggling. A lot of states, it's MP, uh, uh, MP is one of them, Manipur. There are many states where there are still pain relief medicines are not available and we are working with the drug controller, we are working with the institutes there to get it available for their institutes. We'll go to the next one. So this is what Dr. Raj says, uh, we should not be pro-opioid or anti-opioid, we should not feel scared of procuring it, but we should actually be pro patients and procure it and ensure that it is not misused or it's not, there is no pilferage around it. So that is what is, uh, is about opioids, how you can procure them. If I'll again give a break and ask you if you have any questions around this. Dr. Sunil, Dr. Sridevi, if you want to add anything uh, here, oh, please feel free. And then probably we can pick up from there. Anybody? And if you are planning to uh, apply for uh, RMI? Is anybody in the group who are planning to have a palliative care center yourself or in your uh, institute, a department or? Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to ask. Ours is a it's a corporate setup, but it has our. Uh, I mean, we are an RMI, so I am a dedicated uh, pain and palliative care unit in our hospital. So we have. Uh, so, uh, so like, if I want to like open up a small department, so how do I go about it? Okay, so Nilakshi, you are from Hyderabad, right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. So Hyderabad is another uh, state where we have good availability of palliative care as well as not like extreme one, but uh, 
better than other states and uh, even the morphine availability. The drug controller is also very supportive. So that's why you have RMI and all. We have Spursh Hospice and there is also MNJ Cancer Institute, MNG. which is yeah, yes. which is running palliative care centers. Now, if you want to open up a new clinic of yours, so one of course the first thing you are already doing is that you have got yourself trained in palliative care. The second option, uh, the second step would be getting these medicines available for yourself, uh, for your clinic, and for that you will have to apply for because it's a private institute or a private clinic. You will have have to apply it through that. Uh, 3F certificate that we showed you, 3F application okay. form. And with okay. all those five things that I mentioned uh, on the slide, that is what you will have to submit to your drug controller in Hyderabad. Okay. And within 60 days, they should be able to issue you that. Sometimes some drug controller do make a visit to the center as an audit okay. before... Okay before really giving the certificate, they will make sure that you have, uh, there are certain basic requirement also, when wherever you are procuring opioids, uh, wherever you are stocking them, that has to be a double door locker. That's yes, another requirement by the drug controller. You have to have a double door locker and they might visit you to see your files, how you are going to maintain it, and to see where you are procuring those, uh, stocking those medicines. And after the audit, if they are satisfied, they, and definitely if you are a palliative care center, they generally, uh, you know, with no, uh, no uh, hurdles, they clear it and they give you the certificate. And in any case, if you feel that you are not able to work through it, uh, for Hyderabad, uh, our regional facilitators, Name is Lalit. Uh, uh, Lalit can be reached out. I think we'll put it in the chat box, all the regional facilitators' numbers. So accordingly, you can uh, reach out to them. Does that answer your question, Nilakshi? Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Then we have, I think, uh, Sushma Ravula was saying, you work in a medical college. And uh, Sushma, your medical course, I'm sorry, I missed. Uh, which state is it? Uh, Telangana, ma'am. Telangana, same, I think. So, yeah, yeah yes. same where Nilakshi is. So, this would be the same process. And I feel the drug controller there is very understanding. That's why, uh, you know, we have not seen many problems in the state of Telangana in issuing of RMI. So, Lalit again can help you if you really wish to uh, apply for one. But for medical college, uh, you would not need, if you want to do anything within the college, then you would not need the certificate. You simply have to, I think, uh, first would be just check with your pharmacist how they are procuring. And uh, if they are procuring directly from the vendor, uh, great, they can continue doing that. Uh, but who is the person responsible? There must be a doctor responsible. So that process is there. And where, who is maintaining the documentation, how the documentation is maintained and how uh, it is being stocked with the pharmacist also. So that you might want to check. And if there are an internal um, system, like you have those internal supply systems. So if he's procuring from there, then, uh, of course, that's a, that's a different process that you have to follow internally. Is there any particular questions from you, uh, Dr. Sushma? So, Sinia has put up the regional facilitator's name and number uh, for all the region. noted them now. I made a note of it. Thank you. So Lalit is for South, uh, so primarily or South states, uh, you know, Kerala, Telangana, Hyderabad, oh, sorry, uh, AP, Andhra, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, and uh, including the Union territories of uh, Pondicherry, Andaman, and Lakshadi. Lalit is responsible for that. Uh, Sunanda takes care of more of central region, which is uh, Maharashtra, Goa, Orissa, and Gujarat. And uh, Ron takes care of Northeast, uh, that is 
completely, you know, all the seven sisters plus Sikkim plus West Bengal and Rajender along with another person, Syed. Uh, I think his name is not there. Uh, Syed takes care of uh, Jammu and Kashmir, uh, Ladakh and Delhi and MP and Chhattisgarh. Uh, otherwise, you could reach out to Rajender directly. He's primarily, uh, you know, right now taking care of entire north. Any other question in particular to your clinic or college or center regarding opioids? I see there are. Should we record the Aadhaar number of person who buy opioids from us? Uh, that is correct. You have to put it in the patient's file. That's how we do it here. So every patient file also need to have a form with the details, how much morphine has been given to them. That's a 3E form, uh, which is... So I think uh, Sinia and uh, Dr. Sunil and Dr. Shirevi, I'm not too sure. Do you have those forms? Do you share it with the team? Uh, those forms, those have been issued by the National Cancer Grid, the guidelines and the form. Yeah, we have it with us. Okay, so that if that can be shared, that is one form that goes in patient's file along with the Aadhaar. Uh, that form maintains the uh, complete documentation of how much opioids you have given. Mm -hmm. Dr. Priya is asking 3A and 3 H is for which purpose? Uh, okay, I will just... Uh, Ma'am, where have you got this 3A and 3H? Uh, Ma'am, in the video presentation, they have mentioned from B to J, Correct. two alphabet. 3A and 3H. These two were missing, so I just wonder what are those for. Okay. So uh, for example, I think 3, no, 3B me... is for private practitioners if they want to apply for uh, higher stock. 3B is there. 3C is there for details of uh, consignment, uh, the receipt. So in this way, every letter has some purpose. So is there three A and three H also, which yeah. are missing in the? Let me let me just have a look one second, and I'll let you know. They're asking about. Oh, oh. Okay, I'll just show you. Uh, I don't think I'll be able to share the screen here. Three. To you answer your question, there is no uh, three A in the whole list of forms. So this is something which uh, the rule, uh, NDPS rule has done. So there is no 3A form. The 3H form is basically uh, for... Yeah, it is the daily accounts of essential narcotic drugs to be maintained by RMI. So it is our daily accounts, which is opening stock uh, every day, like, you know, with what stock you opened, what is the quantity received, what is the, uh, where did you receive from the consignment details, how much quantity was dispensed. So all those, that is 3H form. So there is no 3A form as such. I think we will share this list. I'm not too sure what has been already shared with you, but these are these forms uh, which you have to maintain. They can be shared with you after this. Uh, session. I will bring more clarity to you. Oh, or can, shall I? 
send you. Yes. We're trying to see if we can show you the forms right away. Just give me a minute. So Dr. Sinil and uh, Dr. Sridevi, what would you suggest? Should they maintain different, how, how are we doing at Pallium? Are we maintaining different registers or uh, is it just one register for all the three uh, opioids? No, I think it would be better to maintain separate registers for separate uh, opioids. And uh, even for uh, the doses, different doses, different uh, uh, registers would be better. Otherwise, you will get confused and uh, somebody will write all the things in, a, in the same register. And uh, uh, so those problems can happen. Thank you, thank you. So that's exactly what we have seen in all uh, hospitals that they try to maintain different registers to keep it more simple uh, for them. I think uh, if you are handling big quantity of opioids, it's better to maintain. For that matter, in one of the hospitals we saw, they maintained booklets of these forms. Uh, so if you can see on the screen, there are these uh, forms, form 3B, 3C, 3D. Uh, we'll just keep going down and uh, we'll just keep going down. Yeah. Just hold on. If you see this 3B form is for registered medical practitioner. Now, let me give you a little uh, detail on that. If you just want to be an RMP, registered medical practitioner, that you want to procure opioids as a doctor and not as an institute, this is the uh, thing that you would need, the special authorization for possession. So this is the certificate you would need if you just want to procure it for yourself. However, we don't recommend that because it's a very, very small quantity that uh, you get as an individual. But as an institute, you can apply for more quantity and cater to more patients. So that's why we are, will focus more on the RMI certificates. This is 3B. The 3C certificate is, uh, yeah, this is the certificate, which is uh, not certificate. It's a form consignment note. This is used when every time the stock of opioids are received. So this is what your pharmacist will have to maintain. Then what was the uh, uh, address and name? What was the man manufacturer and complete uh, description and quantity of the consignment that will have to be maintained by the pharmacist and the mode of transport and all those details. This is 3C form. And this 3D form is daily accounts of essential narcotics drug, which is to be maintained by RMP. If you see, this is RMP for, it is very similar to what an RMI also uh, procures. So this is the daily opening stock. On, this again would be maintained by pharmacist if you are in an institute, but if you are an RMP, then you will have to maintain it. Go to the next one. This is the form that will go in the patient's file. Details of the patient to whom essential narcotic drugs dispense. Every patient's file should have this and then you can add. So, Aadhaar number of patient may be added. So, you need to have that Aadhaar. Somebody asked the question just now. Yes, you will have to have that Aadhaar number here. We'll go down. And all the quantity dispense. This is that application which we already showed you, 3F. We go down further. This is the certificate that you will get. 3G form, Certificate of Recognition. So when you will apply in 3F, that is when you will get 3G. Okay, Dr. Priya is saying form 3A is for manufacturer for permission to manufacture and sell. Possibly, uh, thank you, Dr. Priya. Thank you for sharing that. We did not have the information on what the manufacturer has to procure. So, or what forms do they have? So this is a good information. Uh, we'll keep a note of it. Thank you for sharing. 
So this is that 3H form, which RMI has to, it is very similar to 3C uh, that you saw above for RMP. This is for RMI. We go down. 3I, that's the annual return of procurement. Now, this is again, uh, okay, Dr. Priya is doing a lot of searching also. Thank you, uh, Dr. Priya, that's helping us also. I also learned something new in this session now. Uh, okay, this form 3I, it is an annual return of procurement disbursement of essential narcotic drug. Now, this is something that you will have to do for expired drugs. The number of uh, expired drugs that you are returning from your procurement or to the manufacturer or to your supplier, that is the form that you need to maintain at your end. This is again the estimate of annual request, uh, annual requirement we already shared. That's about it. These are the total number of forms that you need. And there are some more details about Department of Revenue when they changed the uh, rule and talking about the medicine. So that you can go through in detail. These documents can be shared with you and you can go through in detail on that. Let's see, just see if there are any more questions. Any more questions around opioids? Uh, I just would want to share one last thing about what are the barriers of so much of myths around uh, regarding the storage of opioids. Okay, I'll, I'll share that. So Isha is asking if we can explain about regarding the storage of opioids. Uh, as I mentioned in the, uh, in the earlier in the session, that you need to have a double locker system or double locker place a uh, double door locker. Like if you have a locker, there should be two doors to it. Like we have it in Pallium India. We have a big locker with two doors. So, and the keys are kept uh, with the pharmacist and two other people. So they, one person cannot open it always on their own. The presence of other two, three are required just to ensure that it is safe. Also, uh, in your, you don't have to be all the time there, but you can assign this responsibility to your pharmacist, to your nurse, to maintain all those records. And then you take the accountability of doing that. In particular, storage of opioids regards to whether they, they need to go in uh, refrigerator or need to be kept out. I think that's a question probably Dr. Sunil Kumar or Dr. Sridevi can answer. If that's what the question is asking, Dr. Sunil. Uh, so morphine tablets uh, and injections can be kept at uh, room temperature. Um, but uh, actually, as per law, if you break one ampule and you do not use the Suppose uh, it contains 15 milligram, then uh, if uh, for a patient only 2 milligram is enough, as per law, you have to discard uh, the rest of it. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sunil. Uh, does that answer your question, Isha? Is there anything particular you're looking for other than that? Okay, great. Uh, Dr. Priya is asking, is bupromorphin covered under NDPS? I think bupromorphin is not covered under this particular certificate, but for that, you need to have the other pharmacy certificate with you. The, that would be the NDPS 2 license or NDPS 7. Dr. Sunil, unless uh, there is some uh, change in how we are doing here, is it? Yeah, uh, so, uh, according to uh, NDPS Act, Government can notify essential narcotic drugs, which are known as ENDs. In short form, it is END. Okay, essential narcotic drugs. So, 
the government uh, notifies this medication and automatically this will come under a recognized medical institution and they can procure and uh, dispense these medications. So uh, as of now, there are six medications which comes under um, ENDs, that is uh, morphine, codeine, oxycodone, hydrocodone, fentanyl, uh, and uh, methadone. So uh, two drugs are not available in India, oxycodone and hydrocodone, but the rest are available. <clears throat> and uh, ambuprenorphine is not, uh, it is not under NDPS Act. Uh, it is, I think, uh, under Schedule H or, Schedule H or something else. So it is freely available in uh, the market and uh, anybody can get it. You need not have uh, RMI status uh, for getting buprenorphine patch. But we uh, discourage the use of buprenorphine uh, because uh, one thing is that um, uh, the um, uh, potency uh, of uh, buprenorphine is not like that of fentanyl or something like that. Uh, if I compare the strength, 12 milligram of oral morphine is equivalent to 5, milli five microgram per hour patch uh, of buprenorphine. Uh, and uh, um, uh, so uh, there are 5 milligram patches, 10 milligram patches, and sometimes 20 milligram. Uh, so uh, if you compare the cost, uh, 5 milligram morphine, uh, it costs uh, only maybe maximum of 1 rupees, even though uh, 5 milligram tablets are, uh, I don't think it is available, only 10 milligram tablets are available, and you can always make it half and use it. Uh, but uh, 10, uh, 5 microgram patch, uh, that will cost about uh, 1000 rupees. Uh, so that's the cost comparison. And another thing, uh, you know that once patch is applied, only constant amount of drug is delivered. So it is not uh, a good medication uh, when the patient's pain is unstable. <clears throat> and uh, another thing is that uh, buprenorphine is a partial agonist <clears throat> and uh, it has a maximum uh, dose after which uh, its analgesic action will not be there. But uh, usually uh, the doses which we require is uh, maybe uh, within the analgesic range. But because of uh, better medications like morphine, uh, fentanyl, methadone all are available, buprenorphine is used very, very rarely. <clears throat> and uh, uh, but uh, it can be, uh, it is available everywhere in the market. So because of the cost. Thank you, Dr. Sunil. I think that answers Dr. Priya's question. She said yes here. Uh, any other question? So I was telling you about uh, you know, the barriers that we have seen with all our experiences moving around in different states, the barriers that we see that why a government institute or a private institute does not have opioids. Uh, to an extent, through all these years of work, we realized that the major barrier now is not that drug controller is not issuing. Drug controller has been issuing uh, these certificates very easily, uh, easily in the sense they, with of course, the due diligence and all is, is taken. Place. The problem is that firstly, medical institutes do not know that they require this cer new certificate for opioids. Secondly, even if they know that they require this new certificate, they don't want to go for it because then they'll have to maintain document issues which they do not have to maintain for other medicines. Like rest, everything is taken care of by pharmacists, but for these essential narcotic drugs, they will have to have these detailed documentation and be more careful and procure them and put them in a safe custody. So because of those additional responsibilities, a lot of times we have seen in the institutes, people don't want to go for that. 
which is a sad affair because uh, with with a good due diligence with a good team uh, that we have with our palliative care centers or with our doctors i think these documentation and ensuring safe custody can easily be uh, maintained the documentation can be maintained the accountability of keeping it safe can be made but the only thing is somebody will have to take that ownership and take it further so lot of lot of institutes we have to go and convince the authorities we have to convince the doctors to start procuring it right now there are so many of fears that what if what if this happens what if if the medicines are misused or if there is a pilferage of medicines so there is we have been maintaining here for the last 20 years now in kerala in all those 600 rmis uh morphine has been procured there are hardly any cases all over india also there are hardly any cases where where you know somebody actually had some punishment or some action taken or anything there have not been cases of too many pilferages across india so there are some fears which just have to be uh thrown away and for the sake of patients we have to build this system in ourselves so it's more of awareness if you feel that your uh, administration or your pharmacist is not very comfortable we would be happy to talk to them we would be happy to tell them and connect you to your state drug controller to ensure that it's not so difficult to procure it and maintain it so i just wanted to share that from our experience from the field Any other question? Then I think we can quickly, uh, Dr. Sunil, Dr. Shidevi, if we can quickly go to the organizing palliative care and I'll quickly touch upon a few points other than medicines that they would need. Okay. Uh, now, that was one aspect of a palliative care service or a palliative care center that uh, we understood. Uh, basically, by a WHO triangle, there are three aspects to any center in any advocacy. One is the drug availability that we have just talked. The other is the education, which is very, very important for any institute to have a palliative care center the doctor, nurse, and a social worker should be trained. That's the very first step for any center to come up. And uh, policy and implementation has particularly been talked about all the government institutes where uh, <clears throat> under the government, under the central government, there is a program called National Program for Palliative Care. Under that program, each district hospital and government hospital have the authority or have the requirement to open up a palliative care center. The only thing is they have to make sure that they indent for it, they ask for it, and then they open up. So there is a budget. There is a whole budget that every state brings it out in terms of a flexi pool where the money can come to run a palliative care unit in any of the government institutes. So I would suggest you speak to your medical superintendent or you speak to the head of your institute if you are interested to uh, open up a palliative care department in your government hospital. There is also state-wise also, there are uh, in the states, the medical colleges and all fall under the state department. So there also, if you reach out to your directorate of health services uh, through them, you can ask for budget to open up a palliative care unit in medical colleges also. Now, I would want to share, just do that. Yeah, how particular, what different kind of centers are there uh, in, in India so far? We have standalone hospices. Uh, we have uh, departments or units within a hospital, which can be a government hospital, charitable, or a corporate one. And then we have community-based home care. Uh, we have a question. Uh,
Correct, uh, Dr. Priya. That's a good question. This is an online training which will make you eligible to be in charge of an RMI. So you can call this out that this training after the certification and all the things, you can apply for RMI certificate. Okay. We go back to... So we'll, discuss, we'll show you the th uh, three examples of these palliative care centers. This is standalone hospices. Uh, any of you can make a guess on what is a hospice? End of life care. Yeah, it's major of uh, majority of end of life care or long term admission where basically patient comes and stays till he dies. Uh, sometimes it can go beyond six months also. Uh, it is more of a global phenomena. In India, there are very few hospices. <clears throat> some of them are like Sipla Pain and Palliative Care. Uh, there was somebody from Nashik, uh, Maharashtra. If you get a chance, do visit the Sipla Pain and Palliative Care, uh, which is in Pune. Uh, uh, then we have Dr. Das in Kolkata. We have Uma Abedna Hospice. I don't know if you have heard of it. We have uh, heard. Yeah, you have heard of it. So they are... Nagur by CNCI. Yes, uh, CNCI and Shantanu from Ruma Baitna Hospice, they have come together to open up this hospice. It's a beautiful hospice where patients come. Right now, majorly cancer patients, uh, hosp these hospices are catering to cancer patients. But uh, that is another advocacy we are doing all over India where non-cancer patients are also uh, given this privilege. The Another one... Yeah, on the left hand side below, you see a picture of Chandigarh Hospice. Uh, Chandigarh Hospice is in Chandigarh, run by Red Cross Society. That is also a, a hospice only for cancer patients. And then we have one hospice in Amritsar. The fourth photograph show you in for Amritsar. Uh, correct, uh, Dr. Nalakshi. Shanti Avedna Southern is also there. They have three uh, different centers. One is in Delhi, one in Bombay, and one in Goa. Uh, correct. Uh, Dr. Sunil Kumar just mentioned. The only thing is Shanti and Avedna Hospice has been the one of its first kind. I think they were the leads in opening up hospice in India. Uh, but there yes, are... Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, because I studied in Subdarjan, so okay, I'm okay. seeing that place close enough. Yeah, yeah. yeah Dr. Lurito D'Souza, who has been uh, Lucito D'Souza, who has been the lead, the radiation oncologist, uh, who actually opened up these uh, hospices. Uh, he's one of our pi pioneers of palliative care, also. So he opened up this. The only thing is, there is a different uh, system there. I'm not too sure how much. Uh, Caregivers are allowed to be with the patient in these hospices. So every hospice has their own rules. In some hospices, the caregiver or the family members are allowed to stay. In some hospices, they are not allowed to stay. Uh, so accordingly, you have to uh, you know, approach them. And again, Shanti Avedna Hospice only cater to cancer patients right now. Uh, we are, again, requesting all these hospices to include non-cancer also. Uh, Karuna Shreya. And uh, Karnashe is another big hospice uh, in Bangalore to, for the people who can visit that. Uh, beautifully uh, made building and it's one of an ideal hospice uh, for the patients with uh, good extracurricular uh, activity, activities available as well as they try to, uh, the whole structure of hospice is made some, in such a way that you have a fountain in the center and the patients can come and uh, around, be around the fountain and the programs are conducted there. There is one Institute of Palliative Medicine in Calicut. It's, uh, this is also uh, a hospice come hospital. Uh, I have a doubt, uh, Dr. Sunil, if you have, is this a hospice or a hospital uh, in Calicut? Would want to confirm uh, because- um, It's mostly um, uh, maybe, like uh, palliative care providing um, uh, not in a hospital setting it's a standalone palliative care unit but not a hospice okay. even though there is a long-term admission is possible okay okay so 
that basically talks about it's a standalone palliative care center. It is not something that is part of a hospital, but a standalone palliative care center. I think their main focus is the home care. Uh, and of course, long-term admissions uh, can also happen. So that's why we have put that in standalone hospices. This is one uh, part of a uh, government hospital. This is from Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, there's this palliative care unit, four-bedded unit. Uh, in Arunachal Pradesh, there is a hospital called Prims. And that's uh, Dr. Tashi Jatong, uh, uh, the doctor there. So this would be one uh, form of uh, hospital unit. Then there is the community model. And that is the model most prevalent in, in, uh, in Kerala, where the community is actually connecting the patient and the medical services. They are being the bridge between them because a lot of times patients are not able to come to the hospitals or uh, come to the doctor where the doctor is sitting. That is where community volunteers come in between. And because we have some, a lot of uh, home care services available in Kerala, they reach out to the providers and ask them to visit the pa uh, patient at home. And that's how community uh, plays a very big role in providing medical services to the patients here in Kerala. And that's the model we are trying to uh, create across India. We are seeing there are a lot of challenges around it, but that's the ideal vision that we have. Uh, this is a story of one of the volunteers. So this is this will tell you basically in all your systems, if you involve volunteers, how they can support you. Uh, just taking a step back, you all are doctors. Of course, palliative care is a multidisciplinary team where a doctor, nurse, and a social worker have to come together to take care of the patient completely. But volunteers can also play a major role by first being a bridge between identifying the patients and bringing them to the hospital where you are working or taking you to the patient. The other way is they can contribute so much around uh, keeping the well-being of the patient. like the social schemes that are available in government, they can uh, share those schemes with uh, with the patients. Like this one story of one of our volunteer, uh, Mr. K. N. Nair, he had his, wi uh, his wife passed away out of cancer and he took that uh, pledge on himself that I'm going to help the others who are uh, facing the same issue because he did not have the idea of how best he can take care of his wife. So he thought that he will contribute. Completely a non-medical professional, uh, a retired army person. He he would visit our, before Kotil, before COVID, he was with, visiting our center and helping us in different ways in, a, in delivery of palliative care. He was managing our sometimes training programs, managing the uh, library, managing some other programs around and wherever possible, pro probably go for home care also and uh, interact with patients there. Now, when a new palliative care center is open, we always suggest a 10-step approach. First of all, you have to arrange for the funds. Uh, as I mentioned, for government, you have state funds and central level funds, which you can ask your uh, directorate to issue you some budget if you have those. And that from there, you can get funds. In private and uh, private hospitals, of course, you will have that revenue coming from the earning of uh, patients paying the cost. Or in a lot of subsidized and sustainable uh, organization, there are different models wherein they charge from the people who can pay and then they make uh, the services free for the people who cannot pay. So there are a lot of models available to arrange funds. Some like ours in Pallium India, we completely depend on donations. So for us, donations are the funds through which we provide our palliative care services. But you can also have self-sustainable models. You can have profit generating models also. All the corporate hospital, one of the big things how palliative care can help you is, and especially COVID has also taught us, uh, the home care services. You can charge for the home care services and each home care services service can get you 
a good amount of revenue for your hospital. So wherever in corporate hospital you're struggling, how to approach your management to open up a palliative care center because this, this is not bringing you enough money. So that is how you can approach them that along with giving more value-based service, it will also bring revenue if we provide home care services to them. The follow-ups that we do, the medicine, if we are providing them the medicine by going to their houses, that will also can be charged. So that's the first step, arrangement of funds. Then of course, there has to be a team recruited, a doctor, a nurse, and a medical social worker. A uh, lot of places, social workers are not there but basic, basic unit of a doctor and nurse has to be there to run a palliative care show. You build an infrastructure. If you're already a, uh, already part of a hospital, the infrastructure is already there. But if you're thinking of opening up clinic or building a hospice, then you will have to have that building and all. Uh, then you procure opioids, the medicines, and... Uh, Okay, I'll take a break here. Dr. Priya is asking, which service are provided in home visit model? So in home visit, I think uh, all kind of service that is possible, so nursing service and uh, social work service and the doctor uh, services that can be provided at home, that is possible. I think for the details, probably Dr. Sridevi and Dr. Uh, Sunil can share that. Uh, could you want to explain more what all services you are providing in home care dr shridevi or oh, dr sunil would you want to go yeah any types of uh, services um uh, like um, uh, those process procedures that we do at hospitals like for his catheterization trials tube insertion uh, parietal examination enema um administering fluids, uh, all these are possible, uh, wound care, and even we have to teach the family member uh, what we are doing. Suppose the patient is having a wound, then uh, we have to actually educate the caregiver how to take care of this wound. So the caregiver can continue to care for the wound rather than calling a nurse every day and waiting for the convenience of that nurse. So basically, uh, you can uh, provide many services that is usually uh, that we usually get from a hospital. Uh, and if you have any specific questions, you can ask so that we can answer. Thank you, Dr. Sunil. Okay, I think that answers Dr. Priya's question. So we go back to the 10 step approach. Uh, so that's what, once we procure the opioid, so we have the system in place. We have a building, we have an OPD, we have a doctor, nurse, social worker there, and we have medicines. Now, now we need patients. We need to inform patients that, yes, there is a palliative care center open because the awareness is not there. So you have to build networks. You'll have to establish connects and create awareness in the masses, create awareness in medical fraternity around you that there is this palliative care center that you have opened. And within the department also, you'll have to create awareness so that the doctors from other departments can send patients to you. That is also a major, major uh, awareness we have to do because sometimes uh, the other departments do not know what all palliative care team can offer them. So that's an internal awareness within your uh, institute that we'll have to create. I think there is a question. Can we take opioids to home? Yeah, Dr. Sunil has already answered. All the home care teams of ours take opioids home. The only thing is we have to maintain a record. So that's one of the uh, very important step for each of the nurse, uh, because ours is a nurse-led home care. Uh, they come back, they go and report the opioids first, how much did they disperse, how much they are bringing back, and then they, uh, in, in the central uh, distribution system that we have, they go and report it there. So it's a daily reporting once the home care team comes back that they have to do. So just want to add something here. Sure. Um, so the responsibility of a recognized medical institution uh, it is uh, it 
like uh, um, it is for uh, the recognized uh, for the medical officer in charge of that uh, institution uh, so uh, even if you ask the pharmacist to uh, dispense the medications and uh, nurse uh, or uh, anybody else ultimately it is the responsibility of the medical officer in charge to make sure that uh, uh, opioids are dispensed it is documented and if uh, anything goes wrong uh, like um, yeah, suppose the drug controller or his representatives they can come uh, anytime and uh, um, check your records and uh, the stock and if there is any imbalance uh, in this then uh, these all uh, are problems and uh, the responsible person would be the medical officer in charge so uh, if you are the medical officer in charge you have to make sure that you check the morphine uh, occasionally and make sure that uh, the stocks and uh, balance and uh, the spend are uh, tallied etc yeah thank you Shani. thank you dr sunil that was helpful uh, so we were talking about the 10 step approach. Yeah. yeah, so once we have created the awareness, we have maintained the connects. Uh, now, depending on our resources, we will look into what we want to start first. Do we want to start OP first? Do you want to start IP first? Do you want to have home care service? Uh, from our experience, we have realized whenever a new palliative care uh, service has to begin, generally OP and home care are the easiest. IP requires more infrastructure. IP requires a place where you can admit the patient. And if you have an admission IP, then you have to have uh, you know a team for 24 hours rotation. So the easiest way to begin a palliative care service is open up an OPD. And OPD also you can have once in a week for your government centers or uh, because it's a new concept so people might not straight away open up for six days or five days so you can keep two days per week OPD or one day to begin with <clears throat> or probably half a day in one suppose you are already doing you're a radiation oncologist you're already have your work there the one day you can specify it that this is for this is a palliative care OPD that you'll be running from uh, 9 to 12 on Mondays. So those three hours you uh, allocate them and then slowly as the number increase, you can further expand it. So OP is uh, for, for people who are in institutes, that is the best way to uh, begin a palliative care service. For other doctors who are actually trying to initiate something from their own end, the easiest is home care. Why? Most of us have a car. Most of us have, uh, you know, we can drive around or most of your dog, if you have a nurse or a social worker or a friend who's ready to accompany you to, to the patients, you are working with an institute or you have a referral patient base to you, those patients, you start visiting in your car and going to them. We know of a doctor after uh, having this, uh, attended this course, he started going to people's houses on his motorbike he will have he was of course a government doctor <clears throat> uh, in a government hospital he uh, just procured some took some medicines or took some follow up and started visiting people in his bike and that was not waiting for anything because he wanted to do it and he started off he will register it back in his institute and take the medicine to to the patient so he was all in one doing i'm not uh, saying that all of you can do that but it's just that home care becomes the easiest if you have a vehicle of your own and if you want to start an individual capacity. And another hands, extra hands that you can have is by involving volunteers. As we just showed you how a volunteer can help, they can provide an extra hand to you to meet your patients in their homes. I believe we have already discussed about this. Uh, we'll move on. Some of the challenges that uh, you know we have seen our doctors are facing or our teams are facing. Uh, 
you know, of, co of course, uh, uh, availability of funds and human resources. This is more into government centers. Uh, the funds are available, the human resources not there. So it is very difficult for them to have a dedicated palliative care doctor who's just doing palliative care. Uh, everybody wants to play safe. I've already discussed with you the procurement of opioids they don't want to do, and that's why they don't want to begin proper palliative care. Inadequate knowledge, uh, that's what we are trying to create awareness and spread education and have that knowledge reach out to uh, all, all medical fraternity and the masses. Limited trained human resource, again, the training and many of uh, or many other organizations like Pallium India is in, involved in training process. So more and more trainings would possibly create more awareness also. And not very lucrative business. This is one thing that we hear from corporate corporate businesses that you know the X-rays and the RMI, uh, uh, the X-rays and the uh, the other ultrasound tests and all would get them money. Palliative care would not get them money. But there are ways we can build up as a financial model also. And a uh, lot of palliative care, uh, private hospitals are getting into uh, palliative care now. And this is one big thing, a mindset uh, in a lot of doctors that they don't want to take palliative care is this doesn't give them a sense of achievement, you know, saving a life and uh, curing a person is more of an achievement. But just being by a side of somebody who is uh, where you just have to improve the quality of life. Some doctors do not find it too interesting uh, to do that or that doesn't satisfy their achievement uh, thrown, you know, target. So these are few things we have seen as barriers, which is in all sectors, particularly government. It is uh, coordination among all for funding for human resource and communication and constant transfer. We will train a team in a government hospital. That government hospital will get the team will get transferred to another place. So again, that full palliative care unit will stop. So these are some of the challenges that we, we have been facing and we are trying to work through it. Lot of uh, state governments are really, really coming up. They are bringing their focus to palliative care. They are very focused on building of palliative care in their district hospitals, in their primary health centers, because there are different programs which is giving money to them for those uh, services. I would, uh, this is the last aspect. I know we are running short of time. The last aspect I want to uh, share with you. There is a standard audit tool to assess a palliative care center. So suppose you open up a palliative care center and you want to know whether your center is actually the ideal palliative care center or how far it is from the ideal palliative care center. So there is a standard audit tool that has been created by uh, by all the pioneers of uh, palliative care in India, which talks about what are the essential ingredients that should be there, essential services that should be there in a palliative care, and what is desirable. I would let you go through, it's a self-study uh, tool, so probably you can ask more questions uh, once you go through it yourself. Oh. I think we'll just stop here. Uh, in trust of time, it's already 7.30. This is what Pallium India is doing. We are running a demonstration center here, which is TIPS. Uh, we are taking this entire, where we are doing an IP, OP, and home care with the involvement of community. This is this demonstration center. We are trying to reach out to all other places in rest of India through education and through facilitation. And that's the role all of us are together doing for uh, the medical fraternity of India and overall the patients. So we'll stop here. Any questions? Anybody? I hope you found this session useful for yourself. To open up a center and how to procure opioids. If you think you have any uh, 
Yes, Dr. Priya, volunteers definitely need a training that would always help them to understand how they can contribute and what are the areas they should be more cautious of because sometimes out of empathy and sympathy, we tend to go overboard or we tend to touch upon things which, which we don't have to, uh, especially when we are dealing with patients. So volunteer training would always help. We always encourage all volunteers to undergo it. Training. Shalini, I think uh, we can wind up the session and uh, all of you have uh, the numbers of uh, our uh, facilitators uh, in different regions and if you need to contact them, please do and uh, they will be helpful uh, in um, doing uh, the need uh, being needed for uh, you uh, to take the pilot care forward in your region. Uh, so thank you, Sharni, uh, for this uh, 